You know, it's always a pleasure to come here on a, on a, on a Sunday morning and, and minister the Word of God um, to people who really want to hear it. And it's exciting. I enjoyed the fellowship this morning. I enjoyed the praise and worship lifts you, up, it takes you to a different level. And that's what's so, so important because you can come into this building and you can feel down. But once you get engrossed into worshiping the one who needs to be worshiped, then it, it, it just you go into a different dimension altogether. And what I want to talk about this morning basically is um, every Sunday, or every Saturday, the Jewish people have got a reading that they have to read from the Bible. It's 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 uh, it's the Torah, and they use different uh, verses coming through uh, the Bible till they get to the end of the Torah. They don't read the whole lot; they just you read scriptures, and it takes them right to the very end of the feasts. And the last feast is, of course, what they call a Sukkot, and we call a Feast of Tabernacles. And then God said to them, stay one more day, stay more one day, and that day is called Shemka Atzeret, which means the eighth day. And the other word, the other line, it's got a slash in it, and then it's got uh, Simcha Torah. And Simcha Torah, Torah means in God's word, God's instructions. It says Simcha means rejoice. So rejoice in the Torah. And unfortunately, that was the day when the October the 7th massacre happened, was when they were rejoicing in the Simcha Torah, and they, they, were, they were attacked. But we always got, to, always got to understand, always got to realize that God is in control, and he's got a reason for everything. And we see, we, get, we look at the media, and we look at people, and we hear things around us. All we've got to do is focus on the Word of God because the, the central part of, of our lives, now that we're born again, is the Bible. It's the Scriptures. Everything that's been predicted, everything that comes out, everything that applies to us, we get it from the, the, the Scriptures. We get it from the Old Testament. We get it from the New Testament. And that's what's so important. So you can hear of wars and rumors of wars, and you, you, you don't have to be deceived by everything that you hear, and you don't have to agree with everything you hear, but you just have to look at the Bible. What does the Bible actually say about it? And this particular reading, um, which looked pretty uninteresting when I was reading it, it's called Toldat, Toldat, um, according to the, 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 the Hebrew. Um, and uh, this week, it's, it's the tool dot portion of Scripture. It's found in Genesis chapter 25, and that's where they take the reading from. And the word tool dot is, it really literally means offspring, or we can widen it, it means generations. So it's the generations after a certain period of time. Now, when we realize that, you know, when God chose Abraham, um, his name was Abram at the time, and God chose him from a land that that was a pagan land. It was a land that was in which today we would look at uh, southern right down to the southern Iraq, and um, from the, the the land of Ur. And God said to him, "Listen," He said, "I want you. I want. I want you to leave your your family. I want you to leave everything you've got, and I want you to go to a place I'm going to show you." Now, if it had been you or I, we'd say, oh, let's just think about this. Now, we'll make, have to make various plans, and, and we can't just up and go. Abraham up and went. And he went because he believed in the God that, that spoke to him. So he believed in the living God. And because he believed, then the Bible says that his faith was accredited to him. And when he moved, and he moved, and he, he went, and he took his wife, and, and his wife, Sarah, and then Mo, God said to Moses, you know, you, or God said to Abraham, he says, you're going to have a child. So there we get told that. So we get the generations. You're going to have a child, and then you're going to have a, you're going to have a child that I'm going to give you. But it didn't happen overnight, and Moses didn't think it was going to happen really much uh, because he was about 90 years old at the time and close to 100, and she was close to 90. And uh, it, it, it took years and years and years and years and years until eventually yeah, Sarah thought, well, look, why not we'll, we'll help out? So she then obviously went to the uh, her Egyptian slave, and she said, you must sleep with my husband. And uh, Abraham was okay with that. Uh, so here's a lesson. The first lesson this morning is that if your wife tells you to sleep with somebody else, the answer is no. <laughs> because the problems that came afterwards was far too great. Um, but in those days, the culture allowed it, and, and that, was, that was okay. 
And eventually, when Ishmael was born, Ishmael was about 15 years old. And when he was actually told he wasn't the child of the promise, because the child of the promise was the child of the promise of God, not a child of the promise of, of Sarah. And so therefore, he, Sarah eventually had to put them out because there was animosity was growing between Sarah and between Hagar and between Ishmael and between uh, the young Isaac. So this problem was, was going on for, for a while. Eventually they, they went out and, and then uh, Isaac had a, he, ma he, he married and his wife came. Abraham says, I don't want you to marry the people that live around here. I don't mean around here, Pine Town. I don't want you to marry the, the people that live where we live. They lived in a place called Canaan. It wasn't called Israel at that time. He said, I don't want you to marry a Canaanite woman. In the Canaanites, there was, uh, you, you had the different tribes like the Amalekites. You had the Hittites. And today we have the Mozibites. But, you know, so he, didn't, he, didn't want, he didn't, definitely didn't want that, that to happen at all. And so he said, I want to, I'm sending my servant. And he sent a servant and he went back to his own land. And there he chose a, a bride and, and her name was Rebecca. And we know the story. And it would, she was standing by, or um, the servant was standing by the well. And, and he said, Lord, please, you know, just show me which, which girl it is. Because a lot of the ladies would come in the morning and fill up the buckets of water from the wells. And eventually God showed him which girl it was. And then he asked her, and she had to go to her family and ask permission. And the family said, yes, you can go if that's what you want to do. And she chose to go with this um, servant back to the land of Canaan and back to Isaac. And when she was coming back there, she had never seen him before. And as she was coming back there, then he sees her at a long distance away because he's going to be the groom. She's going to be the bride. And he's walking in the fields and he's looking for her. He's out looking for her. But the servant that went to bring her back fetched her. Isn't that amazing? How the Bible tells us how we were, were fetched. The Holy Spirit goes out to fetch a bride for Jesus Christ. And Jesus is waiting and watching for us. And he's eagerly waiting. But he can only come back when the father says, go get, go get. And Isaac, went, when he saw her, then he realized and he ran and he got her and he lifted her up and he put her on his camel. I, 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 didn't, I didn't do that with Bev. Uh, the camels were... were well, they, were, they weren't really working on those days. And uh, plus, I think we smoked something else. It wasn't camel. <laughs> Incidentally, we went on a trip to uh, Zanzibar and on, when they had those cruise ships coming out of Durban. And you bought two and got two free. Four of us were able to go um, to uh, Mombasa and to Zanzibar. And as I was going through Zanzibar, one of the Zanzibar um, uh, Arabs came to me and they wanted, they offered me three camels for Natasha. They said, I'll give you three camels for her. Yeah. And I thought to myself, you know what? I wouldn't even take a whole pack of camels for her. <laughs> but, but, but. But that's a, that, that's, a, that's a true story. So told that. So we, we come down, and it's a generation. So it's a generation thing. And here we, de we now are in the place where in Genesis 25, Abraham was chosen from the pagan family. And now we've got uh, Isaac, who's now born. And, and we can see, you know, we, we can see how much faith that, that Abraham had. And Isaac was a teenager, and he was the promise of God. Yet of all, God said to him, Abraham, I want you to take your son, your only son, who you love. Interesting point here. When we read this in the book of Genesis, when he says, I want you to take your son, your only son, he wasn't literally his only son because Ishmael was his only son. But Isaac was the son that God had promised him. So therefore, they tried to break the promise of God. And when man tries to break the promise of God, we end up in big trouble. So he then took Isaac, his son, his only son, the one, the, God says, the one whom you love, 
It's the first time the word love is mentioned in the Bible. He says, take him. And so I, Abraham gets up and it, he saddles his donkey and he takes him with two servants. And then God says, I will show a mountain for you. Now, the place is covered in mountains. He says, but I will show you a mountain, a special mountain. And that special mountain is where I want you to sacrifice your son. You know, you start thinking, whoa, hold on a second, what's going on here? But Abraham obeyed, and he took, and as they got off the, uh, after riding for three days, isn't it interesting, three days, um, Abraham got off, took Isaac with him, told the servants, we'll be back. He says, we will be back. He didn't say, I'll come back. Now, he knew he had to go and sacrifice his son, but he said, we will be back. His faith was tested. And Abraham took the young, he was probably a, a teenager. He wasn't a young boy. He was a, probably a teenager at this stage. And as he took Isaac and he, they went up the mountain and they, he loaded the, the, the wood on the back of, of Isaac. And you see how the wood was put on the back of Jesus when he carried the cross. And remember that the cross that Jesus carried, he carried the cross bar, the cross beam. It's called the storus. If he had carried the upright as well, it would have been too long because it would have to go into the ground six feet and then it has to go above his head. And then that's when they would put on a sign above him. He would never have been able to carry. None of them would have been. So they used to carry the storus, which was the, then that storus was nailed either to a, an upright or to a tree. The Bible says he was nailed to a tree. Some people believe it, it was a, an upright. It's immaterial. The reason is he died on a cross, whatever way that cross was made. He died on a cross and he rose again. And here we find that also when, when he was on that cross, the Bible says, and they came to see if he was dead. And they went, and if they, if they weren't dead, they would break their legs. Of course, when they break their legs, then they can't breathe anymore. So the Bible says he, they went to one of the, uh, the criminals on the cross and they broke his legs. And then they went to the other one and broke his legs. And then they came to Jesus and he was already dead. Now, in my line of thinking and in the way I work with my Irish head is that was one, two, three. One, break his legs. Two, break his legs. Three, he's dead. But yet of all, we always see that the cross of Jesus is in the middle, which would have meant that the soldiers went back and forward. My theory is he was crucified on a huge round tree with her because they were all able to talk to one another. And it makes sense to me that they could talk and they could mock and they could get saved. One got saved on the tree and one was mocking on the tree. But they were there and they were facing the, the temple of God. And the temple of God was was in Jerusalem. It was in the Temple Mount. And they were able to witness, along with the centurion, the ripping of the veil of the temple. Now, we can go to Israel today, and you will see a, a couple of places where they say, this is where Christ was crucified. And to be honest with you, I honestly believe that where Christ was crucified, they, they, if we really knew where he was crucified, then the place would be more important than the purpose. And the purpose is Christ was crucified so that he could be buried and raised again. That's the whole point. But the only place that you could see the temple from where uh, anywhere around Jerusalem would have been on top of the Mount of Olives. And the Mount of Olives is where Jesus used to go to. The Mount of Olives is where he met his, a lot of his disciples. The Mount of Olives is where he was arrested. The Mount of Olives is where he went back to. The Mount of Olives is where he rose again for, up uh, when he ascended into the heavens. And the Mount of Olives in uh, Zechariah 14 verse 4 says that's where he's coming back again. So we're, uh, that's so important. But the, going back to Tolga, the generations leading up to Jesus is important because we see now that Isaac is about to be, he's like a type of Christ that's going up this mountain with the wood on his back. He gets strapped and put onto the ground. And he said, Dad, he says, I can, I can see things. He says, I can see the wood. He says, and I see you're carrying the fire with you. He said, but where is the lamb? Interesting. Where is the lamb that God is going to give? And Isaac says, 
Do not worry. God will provide for us. And that's where we get Jehovah Jireh from. God is our provider. He says, God will provide. And as he was about to strike the boy, the angel of the Lord said, stop. Do not kill the boy. And then they heard a rustling. And in the bush, there was what? A ram, not a lamb. So why was there a ram and not a lamb? Because that's the lamb was supposed to be provided. And the reason being, if a lamb had been provided, then all the theologians ever since would have said that that fulfillment was already done. The lamb of God had already been taken place. So it was a ram. The lamb of God was going to die about another thousand years later on a cross in Golgotha. Interesting, Isaac then, it was time for him to get married. When I say it was time for him, he was about 40 years old. And off then, Eliezer goes to find him, the wife, 40 years old, finds him this young, this young maiden. She comes back and they have a great time together. And God says he's going to bless them and bless the nation. And through them, all, the, all nations will be blessed. He told Abraham that, he told Isaac that, and he told Jacob that. So Isaac was, you know, his wife was Rebecca. And guess what? She was barren, the same, same as Sarah was. So they started to pray. And they prayed that she would become pregnant. And you know how long the prayers took? From they got married? 20 years. 20 years. Isaac prayed when he was 40 and when he was 60, she conceived. She must have been a young maiden. And then when she got older, she conceived. And I, in, her, in her womb, she was having a rough time because there was two babies in there. She was all about, she was going to have twins. And there was, there, were, there was like a fight there. And she asked God, she says, why am I having so much trouble, trouble with my pregnancy? And God explained to her, he says, because in your womb, you've got two nations. He said, and the younger will serve the older. And when they came out, you know, the, uh, Isaac, uh, Jacob put his arm out and the, the, the midwife you know, put a string around it. And then Esau came out. Now Esau came out first, but it was Isaac's hand that came out first. <clears throat> and when, they, when Esau came out, it was called Esau. Esau means like um, he, was, he was of a, a reddy color, a ruddish color. It's, um, it's like uh, Adam, uh, which means red. He was that sort of color. And he was hairy. Um, and Jacob, when he came out, he was more refined. Um, and that, that proved to be in the case with the, with the later, with, with, the, with the way they were, because Esau was a man's man. He was a hunter. He went out and he went hungry. And Jacob, he stayed in the tents, not like as a mommy's boy, but he stayed in the tents to study the Torah, to study the word of God. And Esau would come back, and then Esau sold him this, uh, the, the, the birthrights over a bowl of lentil soup. And, and, uh, and that's where we then, from then, we've had nothing but problems with uh, the Middle East. And that's the way it's been going, and that's the way it's been continuing. So all of this has been done. And, and when, when Abraham said to his servants, me and the lad are going up there to worship God. That was the first mention of worship in the Bible. But he said, we're going to go up there to worship God. So Sarah's solution caused a bit of a problem. And Esau and Jacob, and Jacob was called, uh, Jacob means the heel catcher, because he was catching the heel of, uh, it must have been like Black Friday, you know, when you're trying to get to a, something that's for sale and you're pulling people out of the way. He was grabbing the heel of Esau and trying to pull him back. Interesting, too, is that Ishmael, um, Jacob had 12 sons. Ishmael also had 12 sons. What we find uh, through Scripture is that, that the, the satanic powers that be uh, around us and around us today, are, they duplicate everything, everything. I mean, you get, we're coming into a, a period now of AI, and AI can duplicate you and me, and so you don't even know if I'm really up here. Uh, it could be just something that's been created by AI. I can tell, rest you assured, it is me, because AI wouldn't have as many pains as I have. 
but it would be up here, and he's, he's duplicated everything when God told him, the Israelites, to put marks on their forearms, to put that uh, on their heads, the phylacteries on their head. Then we see Satan comes along with the mark of the beast, a mark there and a mark here. So there's nothing but duplication with, with Satan. He doesn't create. He copies the whole time. So and as God of creation that we're here this morning to, to, to worship, you know, and Isaac prayed and he prayed and he prayed for 20, 20 years and he prayed with his wife. It wasn't like that he was praying and said, oh, please. You know, he was praying with his wife for 20 years. But you know what? Isaac was sowing the seed. He was actually sowing the seed. But it's only God that opens the womb. And that's what we got to remember. When we're praying for people, we're sowing the seed. But only God can open the minds and the hearts of the people that we're praying for. And that's what we've got to look forward to, 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 to see. God, let's, let's do this. So there's two nations we're in our, uh, in our womb. And... You know, the, the, the Jewish people have suffered. The, the J Jacobs, the Israelites, obviously, it was split. There was split between the northern tribes, the southern tribes, and the southern tribes were taken away. And eventually, at AD 70, when the Romans conquered the whole temple, 40 years after the death of Christ, we find that they were told to get out of the country and they were dispersed, the diaspora, all over the world. But God said in Ezekiel that I am going to bring them all back again. And we see the Holocaust as something that was really horrific, and it was it was horrific. Six million deliberately being lined up, deliberately being humiliated, deliberately being um, experimented on with with medication, and deliberately being gassed in the gas chambers. We sit with, and you think, Lord, these are you, these were your chosen people for a purpose, and He says, Yes, my purpose hasn't finished with them, and because of that, six million people the land of Israel was eventually born in 1948 when they got it. But the next day, the Arabs actually in, uh, went to war in that particular uh, time. But Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and their descendants, uh, in Genesis 27, Isaac says to, 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 to Jacob, he said, you know, anyone who curses you will be cursed and I will put a curse upon them. And that was the, uh, against anyone who cursed against the Israelites. But the reading of told that really is mostly about the blessings because during the famine, when, when Abraham went to, the, to Canaan, and there was a famine in the land and he went to Egypt. When Isaac was growing up, there was a famine in the land. God said to him, don't move. You stay there. Why? So that you can trust in me. You know, the New Testament tells us, it says there in, uh, in, in, in the book of Peter, it says, don't be surprised at the fiery trials that you're going through. Do not be surprised. He says, because these fiery trials, he says, are, you're going through, you're going through them with Christ and his sufferings. And that is so hard for us to get hold of, to grab, to get our heads around, because we often think, no, but we, we should be protected now. Paul says, no, we've got to put on the armor of salvation, but not just uh, something physical, something that we've got to do in our spiritual and in our mental way. The readings about blessing, God blessed them for trusting him. And <clears throat> He said, stay in this land, and God blessed Isaac as he stayed in this land. So in so many dire situations that we come across, we will see that. And as we see the spirit of Esau still working today, we look at the television, we look at uh, the, the newspapers or, the, or, or on your devices, and you see there's a horrific war going on in the Middle East at the moment. And we've got to remember that the Middle East is the the time clock for things to happen. And things are happening pretty quickly in, in the Middle East. Things are changing quite a lot. It was Jesus who said that when you see these things happen, he says, they've got to happen. He says, and when you see them, all right, why do they have to happen? Well, they have to happen because Jesus came for the lost sheep of Israel. That's what he came for. And then when he went down Mount, the, uh, the Mount of Olives on his donkey on, on Palm Sunday, as we would call it, Palm Sunday, just the week before the, the Passover, he went down and he cried because he wanted them. They were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, uh, Jesus, free us. 
but they meant free us from the Romans. And as he looked and he could see, and he cried and he wept and he said, oh, if you only knew, if you only knew how much I desired just to bring you and cuddle you and put you under safety as a, as a, as a, as a mother hen would, would cuddle her chicks and keep them warm and keep them safe. But he knew what was going to happen. He knew about the, the devastation. He knew that there was going to be, it, they were in for the long haul. He knew that the, that the temple was going to be destroyed. He knew all of these things was going to happen. And he says, and these things have to happen. And then you think, well, why? Because God's got a purpose for everything. He's got a purpose for the history. He's got a purpose for what's happening now. And he's got a purpose for you in your life. And this is a testing period. These periods that we are going through today are testing periods. They're, we've all been tested beyond what we've normally been tested. When we were younger, we, had, we didn't have as many tests. In fact, when we didn't know the Lord, we didn't have as many tests. I remember when I was baptizing Wayne, and, and I said to Wayne, you realize that after you get baptized openly here, you may come under attack. That was a few years ago, and I don't think he's been stopped being under attack since then. But it's a fact, because you're standing up, you're saying, I, this is the one I believe, and I believe in Christ. I'm standing for him. And when you stand for someone, it's, uh, you'll fall against someone else, and we fall f against the, the evil one. The spirit of Esau is still going along today. The spirit of Esau that, that wants to take over the the, the land and, the, and to get rid of his brothers, that is, that's, that's a big factor that's happening today when we look at, at the Middle East. But what we've got to do is not look at CNN or, or Sky News or BBC or your local TV stations. And it doesn't matter who votes them in or who votes them out. It doesn't matter if they're expelled from embassies here or if they're expelled from embassies over there. The fact is that when we come to Ezekiel 38 and 39, the whole world will turn against Israel. And that when we think, well, what about America? America is not even mentioned in Ezekiel 38. So what does that indicate? It indicates to me that America will be taken out of this whole situation. How? I don't know. I do know they're being attacked a, a lot at the moment. Isaac, when he was in the land of Canaan, he reopened the wells that Abraham had dug because the Philistines, they had filled all the water wells up and these were in the desert. So we, these wells were important and they had filled them. They stopped them up with dust and, so that they couldn't have any water, which we would hear on the TV is a war against uh, humanity. Um, we'll take them to the International Criminal Court. And meanwhile, Nothing ever happens. Jesus said when he was talking to the Samaritan lady and she was sitting beside Jacob's well, and he said to her that he is the source of living water. And that's what we got to look for. We as Christians today in this age, we... We look at the Bible. We see how it's going to work out. We know what's going to happen uh, eventually. But, for, but one thing that we must know that God is a God of promise, and He has said that He is the He is the life-giving water. So the heirs of God's blessing are heirs of His promise. And I want to tell you that 99 percent of of the Jewish people today are not believers that Christ is the Messiah. Now I know that some of us belong to maybe a messianic believing groups, but 99% of overall the Jews in the world do not believe and accept Christ as the Messiah. That has to happen. That's going to happen. And it'll only happen when they see that he is the one that is going to rescue them. It's not going to be America and it's not going to be the IDF, but they haven't received that epiphany yet or they haven't received that revelation in their mind. And the Bible says that in the last days, the times of the Gentiles is going to be finished. The time of the Gentiles is going to be over. What does that mean? It means that, that, that from Babylon right the way through to today, the, the, the Gentiles have been in control of, of the Jews. The, the, the Gentiles have been in control from way back 586 years before Christ right up until now. 
that the Gentiles have been controlled. It was the Babylonian Empire. It was the Greek Empire. It was the Roman Empire. Then the Roman Empire split. There was two empires. Then we come into the empire we're living in now with the feet of, of, of at the bottom of that statue. And it's a mixture of clay and iron. And clay and iron don't mix. And here we see that the meetings of the of, of the uh, Arab states and the meetings of the European states and, and the meetings of the Chinese are all coming together to meet. It won't work and it's not going to happen. The Bible then tells us in the book of Daniel, but a rock that was not made by hand, who? Jesus, guess, who was not made by hand will come and smash them. So we know that it fits into the Ezekiel war. We know that it's happening. We know that when we look into the Bible now, we can see that there's going to be victory. Victory for the all. Romans 11 tells us that in that day, they will look and they will see the one whom they have pierced. Who's they? All of the Jews will look and they will see the one whom they have pierced and they will weep and wail and they will accept him. And then it says, and all Israel will be saved. Now, does that mean that everybody in Israel is going to be saved? No, it means that all of Israel that believe that Jesus is their Messiah will be saved. There are time is coming. The time is coming when there will, the time of the Gentiles is coming to an end. Now, what does that mean? It means that that when God takes over, the Gentile period is going to be finished. We're not going to be looking at, at guns and, and all sorts of bombs and, and schools being hit and hospitals being killed. Uh, we're, we're going to be looking at Christ Jesus as he comes back and how he handles things. Now, is he going to come back with hand grenades and is he going to come back with all sorts of things? No. Why? He said he's going to come back with his word. And with his word, he created the world, this earth. And with his word, he just has to speak and a volcano will erupt. With his word, he just has to speak and an earthquake will take place. With his word, he can send winds. He can send hurricanes. With his word, he he can send hell on this earth. And the TV people will say, whoa, Mother Nature is really bad today. God is, will have everything. He's got everything under control. And as Paul says, when we're on this earth, we have got to have the ministry of reconciliation and work at the ministry, reconciling people you don't even want to. People, God has already reconciled the world to him, but the world isn't all going to come to him. Only those who have got the revelation about God is going to come to him. And when we have to do the reconciliation, all we can do is to speak, to sow the seed, but it's God who opens the womb. So therefore, for the generations to come, we sow and we pray, and God is the one that does the saving. God bless you. Thank you.